Welcome to the Church of Abundance. This is Christmas Sunday, the 26th of December at 10 a.m. And you are with the pastor. We have a musical introduction, a Deste Fidelis. <laughs> Thank you. What a beautiful piece of music. And you're with the Church of Abundance today with the pastor. It's 10 a.m. and it's Christmas morning. Thank you for joining Pastor Franz and the Church of Abundance. I just pray that you'll get a blessing out of this today. Father God, we just thank you that we can meet like this today. And we just pray that the material that we go through on church history will be enlightening and that it will be a blessing to everybody who, who tunes in and listens to this. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy. Thank you. That was a beautiful piece of music. Father God, we just pray that you'll guide us today in our studies and we're going to look at the Inquisition and the decline of the Roman 
Catholic Church or Roman Catholicism. And we just pray that you'll be with us today as we look at these things. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Let's start off with the Inquisition of the Roman Catholic Church. The last times have been going on for about 2,000 years now. So we are in the last time of the last times. So it does seem as though we're getting close to the end. We know that Antichrist shall come. There are many Antichrists that will be coming prior to the Antichrist. The Antichrist is associated with the great whore of Revelation chapter 17, the great whore of Revelation. She is known as the mother of harlots. She will be growing throughout the church age. The Bible states, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. This woman definitely involves the Roman Catholic Church. So it may not just be the Roman Catholic Church, but it will definitely be a part of the great hall of revelations. Now the Inquisition is a term that describes the Roman Catholic Church sending out men to find heretics. Now these heretics were almost exclusively Baptists, but there were a few other people besides Baptists, and to interrogate them and try and get them to recant their faith. This inquisition began earlier than the 13th century. Most history books have it beginning in the 13th century, but it really began in the 10th century, and strictly speaking, it begins in the 5th century with the, as the Roman Catholic Church started to be coming to its own. Now, let's just look at a few of the popes and how they contributed to the Inquisition. Pope Honorius II, who lived in the 12th century, ruled as Pope in the 12th century, called for persecution for all heretics. Actually, a heretic was anybody who didn't agree with the Roman Catholic Church. Pope Innocent III, also from the 12th century, ordered the systematic persecution of all heretics throughout Rome's kingdom, or empire, you could say. He forbade the people to read the Bible. He didn't allow them to translate it into common language. He started the Crusades, which mainly went after heretics, <clears throat> such as the Valdenses or the Abigenses. Now, these were all brands, I suppose, of ancient Baptists. They didn't call themselves these, but these are the names that the Roman Catholic Church gave to them. And then we go to Pope Gregory the Ninth. He came in the 13th century. He began the orders of the Dominicans and the Franciscans. These were monks. They were given authority to hunt down heretics. He issued bulls which promised great rewards for citizens who assisted in the capture of heretics. A bull is like a, a law, but it comes from the Pope. And that's what a bull is. <coughs> Those who were caught by the inquisitors had no legal recourse whatsoever. They couldn't get a lawyer or anything like that. If the Inquisition had captured you, you had absolutely no recourse to anything. The government and the legal system was subordinate to the church. At times, even Roman Catholics were arrested if they said anything at all that would go against the church. And of course, all the 
property of the heretics was confiscated from the families. So it was really catastrophic. It destroyed the families completely. The Inquisition spread across Europe and then throughout much of the known world. They networked across the world with descriptions of key heretics. Thus, there was nowhere safe to hide out for these Baptist preachers. That's right. The heretics were in actual fact Baptist preachers. Through torture, they got the heretics to tell of the whereabouts of other Baptists or other heretics. There was a wide variety of methods of torture that was used on most of the heretics. <clears throat> All of these methods of torture were developed by the popes themselves. It was developed by the church. It's the most horrific torture that exists in the world, and it comes from the Roman Catholic Church. Here is a list of just some of the methods commonly employed. The rack was like a, a bed that you lie, lay down on, and they fastened your hands and your feet, and they pulled it in different directions with a system of gears, and it stretched the joints to the point of dislocation. At times, they would become dislocated. The pulley was strung, strung up to hang by one's arms or even thumb, and then weights were added to the feet. This was useful for the Roman Catholic Church because if there was a, a beam, a, a roof beam, they could just employ the pulley from the, from the roof beam. The heretic's fork. Now, this was a sharp fork that was rammed between the sternum, that, that's the top of your rib cage, um, just going into your throat. There, there's a, like a little notch there, that's the sternum, and the chin would push the head back. So they would put the heretic's fork in place with the strap around the neck, keeping it in place, and the hands tied behind the back or tied somewhere. So you couldn't get your hands to this heretic's fork. And then the victim would have to stay in a very uncomfortable position because if they allowed their chin to go into a natural position, it would actually, um, it, it would go right into the flesh. It, it could be fatal as well. <clears throat> the heretic's fork, compliments of the Roman Catholic Church. Here's some more examples of commonly employed methods. The galleys, now, now the galleys were, were big ships, but they were mainly moved around by rowing power. So they had these teams of slaves who had to paddle these large warships. They were warships. So the heretics were used as slaves to paddle all the large warships. And the lifespan, once you got into the galleys, was very short. From what I understand, within two years, you would have, um, you would have passed. They were treated like animals, unmercifully. The god would, gods would practice painting Calvin's back on these slaves, which meant that they would whip their backs and cause rivers of blood to flow, thus painting the back. Of course, Calvin, because he was a Protestant, and they were anti-Protestant, but especially <clears throat> anti-Baptist, more especially. So they referred to many of these Baptists as Calvinists, but of course, the Baptists were never Calvinists. So far from being Calvinistic. And this went on all the way up to 1775, which is the 18th century. And the other method of torture was fire. Sometimes they were roasted alive a little by little, so as to enhance the torture, to make it its ultimate. Often they were tied to a post, and then the fire was lit beneath them. They would have public burnings. 
but they would cut out their tongues first so that they couldn't say anything against the church publicly. In these public burnings, the crowd would be ecstatic, ecstatic and joyful at the heretics being burnt. Can you imagine the mindset of these people? They had been indoctrinated to the extent that they actually became ecstatic and joyful when they saw these Baptists burning at the stake. Now, these types of tortures were found going on as late as the 1800s in Madrid and Spain. And not to mention those methods of tortures where you were simply drowned. They called it the third baptism because the Roman Catholic Church brought in the infant baptism, but they said these are the rebaptizers because it's believers' baptism. So they said, let's give you a third baptism. So they just drowned you for the third baptism. They used to, the Inquisition used to test if you were a witch or not by tying you to a beam, and they'd put the beam under the water with you tied to the beam for 10, 15, 20 minutes. And then when they brought it up, if you were alive, you were a witch. And then you subsequently needed to undergo further torture. If you died, then you were not a witch. One of these catch-22s, very tragic. Now, the Catholics would often turn the heretics over to the Roman governmental authorities to carry out the death sentence. And in this way, the Roman Catholic Church could claim innocence in these mass murders. Very much in the same way that Jesus was handed over to the, the Roman authorities, and they said that they, they weren't guilty that the high priests, the Jewish high priests, because Rome had done it, not, not them. Though many, many were killed at the hands of the Roman Catholics in their torture chambers and prisons. Many died in prisons, perhaps more died in prisons before they even had the opportunity to burn in public. It is estimated that over 50 million heretics some people bring it closer to 60 million, were tortured and murdered by the Catholics during the Dark Ages, and that is mainly from the year 500 to the year 1500, a period of 1,000 years, although it went on well into the 18th century, getting quite close to the 19th century. It was still being burnt at the stake. Let's listen to O Holy Night by John Sayles, a musical interlude, a beautiful piece of music on the guitar. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. What a beautiful piece of music. Let's look now at the decline of Roman Catholicism between the 14th and 16th centuries. The Vatican decrees in the high Middle Ages, means at the height of the Middle Ages. The seven sacraments were defined by Peter Lombard in the 12th century. Transubstantiation was defined by Pope Innocent III in the year 1215. Now, transubstantiation is a belief that the bread and the wine become Jesus Christ's incarnate, in, in a way you can say. They become the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. They don't remain the what they normally are, just bread and wine. Now, that's the transubstantiation or the doctrine of transubstantiation. Pope Innocent III brought that in in the year 1215. Auricular confession of sins to a priest instead of to God was instituted again by Pope Innocent III also in the year 1215. Now, in the year 1220, the adoration of the wafer or the host was decreed by Pope Honorius III. So, in other words, what they were saying is that the wafer or the bread that was blessed, you had to adore that and worship that, bow down to it, as though it was Jesus Christ itself. That is what the ad adoration of the wafer or the host is all about. And in the year 1229, the Bible was forbidden to laymen, laymen being ordinary people like you and me. And the Bible was placed on the index of forbidden books by the Council of Valencia. And this all took place in the year 1229. Now, the scapula was invented by Simon Stock of England in the year 1251. To just give you a brief description of the scapula, it's basically like a little purse, you can say, made out of material, typically. Um, it can be quite fancy. And in there, you can put a, a note with some sort of prayer, typically a prayer. And then it's connected with a string to another similar sort of a square little pouch. Also, you can put a prayer into that as well. And then you simply hang it over your neck. The one goes to the front of you and the one goes to the back of you. So when you get dressed, you put your scapula on with your prayers and your clothes over that. So they invented the scapula. And I'll just like to say it's not really invented because it was a well-known pagan practice, which was just adopted. Now, the cup was forbidden to the laity at communion by the Council of Constance in the year 1414. So what that meant was that the laity or the ordinary people in the church were not allowed to drink of the wine anymore. They could only eat the bread wafers. So the bread and wine was only for the priests. And then in the year 1439, Purgatory was proclaimed as a dogma by the Council of Florence. And then if we go further, in the year 1545, and this is where it really gets off the rails, that the tradition was declared of equal authority with the Bible by the Council of Trent in the year 15. 45. In, in other words, they could take the tradition and it could overrule or override the Bible, which is actually a very bad thing. And then the apocryphal books, there's about 12 of them altogether, were added to the Bible by the Council of Trent in the year 1546. Now, we don't accept the apocryphal books because they add 
other teachings into the Bible which which don't coincide with the rest of it. So those are the apocryphal books were added by the Council of Trent in the year 1546. Let's talk about the Babylonian captivity. Remember, we're talking about the decline of the Roman Catholic Church. The so-called Babylonian captivity <coughs> was a period of about 70 years in the 1300s during which the popes were captive in France. Now, Pope Boniface VIII in the year 1302 issued the bull Unam Sanctum in which he stated that all rulers were subject to him. King Philip IV of France sent an army to arrest the Pope, and though he was rescued by the townspeople at his home in Anagni, Italy, he died soon thereafter. Now, the next seven popes lived in Avignon in France, and they were under the control of the French kings. Not surprisingly, they were all Frenchmen. <clears throat> so it seems that the French rejected that thing that the church should rule the state. And, and then if you look at the papal schism, if that was not bad enough. Now, if you go back to this period in time, we find that cathedrals, especially during the Dark Ages, can, the most <clears throat> excuse me, beautiful cathed cathedrals were built at this time, and the papacy reached the heart of its power and prestige, and there was more money than you can imagine flowing into the Roman Catholic Church. And most notable in this time period was the papacy of Innocent III, who ruled between the years 1198 and 1216. In the late Middle Ages, the decline of the papacy was rapid. During the 11th century, the East-West Schism permanently divided Christianity. It arose over a dispute on whether Constantinople or Rome held a jurisdiction over the church in Sicily, and this dispute led to mutual excommunications in the year 1054. The Western or the Latin branch of Christianity has since become known as the Catholic Church, while the Eastern or the Greek branch became known as the Orthodox Church. So right about a thousand years ago, or very roughly, we split into the Greek Orthodox or the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church or the Catholic Church. The Second Council of Lyon in the year 1274 and the Council of Florence in 1439 both failed to heal the schism. Some Eastern churches have since reunited with the Catholic Church and others claim never to have been out of communion with the Pope. Officially, the two churches remain in schism, although excommunications were mutually lifted in 1965. And so you can see it was nearly a thousand years of excommunicating each other. And they've lifted it in 1965, but that doesn't really carry much water, doesn't mean much. Now, between the years 1377 and 1417, a period of 40 years, there were two lines of popes, each one cursing the other. During the reign of Pope Urban VI, the church cardinals 
decided to elect another pope, Clement VII. Urban refused to step down and hurled curses and excommunications at the new pope and his supporters. Clement VII in turn excommunicated and cursed Urban. They called each other heretic, demon, antichrist. The Catholic countries of Europe chose sides. Germany and England and some of the smaller states sided with Urban, while Spain, France, and Scotland stood with Clement. Armies went to battle under the standard of their chosen Pope, and blood flowed. When King Henry IV of England wrote to one of the Popes and asked him to step down for the sake of peace, he referred to many thousands of lives that had been lost in this quarrel. Then to make matters even more confusing, the Council of Pisa, which was held in 1409, condemned the two sitting popes, Gregory XII and Benedict XIII, pronouncing them notorious and incorrigible heretics. So the two popes were heretics. And they elected a third pope, Alexander VI. Now, the first two popes immediately cursed and excommunicated Alexander. And he replied in kind. In less than a year, Alexander died and was replaced by John XXIII. So now we have these three popes. Finally, Another council was held in an attempt to end the schism between the popes. This was the Council of Constance, which began in November 1414. Thousands of church officials and political figures, cardinals, bishops, monks, priests, princes, knights, attended the three year council, and they lived in great wickedness, Wiley writes. These dissolute men filled the quiet ancient city of Constance with their unblushing wickedness. To write that which was then open as day would defile the pages of our history. So the council condemned and deposed John the 23rd, Gregory the 12th, and Benedict the 13th. So they condemned these three sitting popes and set up a fourth pope, Martin V. So now we have four popes, can you believe? And he was successful in re establishing himself as the one pope in Rome. This was also the council that invited the Baptist preacher, John Huss, to attend under promise of safety. But when he arrived, he was condemned and burned to death for preaching that salvation was by grace alone and that the Pope was false. So they really tricked this, this poor Baptist preacher. They told him they would have safe journey in and out. I just wanted to speak to him, but as soon as he arrived, he was captured, condemned, and burned to death. The council then arrested Jerome of Prague and burned him to death for preaching the same heretical doctrines. And that doctrine was that salvation was by grace alone. That was the supposed heretical doctrine. The Council of Constance also condemned England's John Wycliffe, and they ordered his bones to be dug up and burnt. His bones, can you believe? 
with all this, these things going on, the people of Europe were greatly confused by the papal schism. Who was the true successor to Peter? Who held the keys of the kingdom? The papacy subsequently lost a lot of its authority. And that question can only be answered if you believe that the Pope is a successor to Peter. But, but that is another discussion. Let's look at Christ and the Pope contrasted. Because the Pope is apparently Christ's representative on earth. Now, according to Catholic dog dogma, the Pope has complete authority over all churches of the world. So if you have a church, the Pope has authority over it. That is from the point of view of, of the Catholics. The Vatican II Council declared, for the Roman pontiff, that is the Pope, by reason of his office as a vicar of Christ, namely, and as pastor of the entire church, has full, supreme, and universal power over the whole church, a power which he can always exercise unhindered. Now, that is in the dogmatic constitution on the church, chapter 3 and 22. Rome also teaches that the Pope distributes salvation through the sacraments. Now, that is blasphemous. Vatican II declared, for God's only begotten Son has won a treasure for the militant church. He has entrusted it to blessed Peter, the key bearer of heaven, and to his successors who are Christ's vicars on earth, so that they may distribute it to the faithful for their salvation. Now that is in the constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, Apostolic Constitution on the Revision of Indulgences, Chapter 4, Stanza 7. And let's just look at a, a few straight-off comparisons. Jesus Christ wore a crown of thorns. The Pope wears a crown of jewels. Christ carried on his shoulders the cross. The Pope is carried on the shoulders of his servants in splendor. Christ declared the laws of his kingdom and urged his followers to do the same. The Pope tramples them underfoot and substitutes his own in their stead. Christ sent the Holy Spirit to be his vicar on earth. The Pope claims to be the vicar of Christ on earth. Christ is the head of the church. The Pope claims to be the head of the church. Christ taught that sin should be confessed to God. The Pope teaches that sin should be confessed to the priests. Christ taught that he alone is the savior. The Pope teaches that the church is the savior. Christ taught that there was but one mediator between God and man, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. The Pope teaches that there are many mediators between God and man. Christ taught that salvation was by grace. The Pope teaches that salvation is by works. Christ claimed infallibility for himself and the word of God alone. The Pope claims infallibility for himself in matters of faith and morals. Christ had no place to lay his head. The Pope lives in a magnificent palace surrounded by wealth. Christ gave his gospel free to all. The Pope sells his masses and other favors. Christ said, Call no man your father upon the earth. For one is your Father which is in heaven, Matthew 23, verse 9. 
the Pope commands all to call him Holy Father, and his priests feel insulted if persons do not address them as Father. Christ was poor and lonely. The Pope's wealth is immense. Christ washed his disciples' feet, this manifesting a spirit of humility worthy of emulation by his followers. The Pope presents his foot to be kissed and requires genuflections and kneeling from those who have audiences with him. Christ taught his followers to pray to God through him. The Pope teaches his followers to pray to the Virgin Mary. Let's look at the 15th and the 16th centuries. Just before the fall of Constantinople to the Muslim Ottoman Empire in the year 1453, in an effort to combat the spread of Islam, or Islam, Pope Nicholas V granted Portugal the right to subdue and even enslave Muslims, pagans, and other unbelievers in the papal bull Dum Diversas, which was issued in the year 1452. Several decades later, European explorers and missionaries spread Catholicism to the Americas, Asia, Africa, and Oceania. Pope Alexander VI had awarded colonial rights over most of the newly, newly discovered lands to Spain and Portugal, and the ensuing patronato system allowed state authorities, not the Vatican, to control all clerical appointments in the new colonies. So the Pope granted these lands to the Portuguese and the Spanish. In 1521, the Portuguese explorer Ferdinand Magellan made the first Catholic converts in the Philippines. The following year, the first Franciscan missionaries arrived in Mexico, establishing schools, model farms, and hospitals. When some Europeans questioned whether the Indians were truly human and worthy of baptism, what a question. Pope Paul III in the 1537 Bull Sublimus Dias confirmed that their souls were as immortal as those of Europeans, and they should neither be robbed nor turned into slaves. Now, if that's not racist, then I don't know. Over the next 150 years, missions expanded into southwestern North America. Native people were often legally defined as children, and priests took on a paternalistic role, sometimes enforced with corporal punishment. That's right. They would take a stick or a cane and give them a hiding as you would to a child. Elsewhere, Portuguese missionaries under the Spanish Jesuit, Francis Xavier, evangelized in India and Japan. By the end of the 16th century, tens of thousands of Japanese followed Roman Catholicism. Church growth came to a sudden halt in 1597 under the shogun Tokugawa Lemitsu, who, in an effort to isolate the country from foreign influences, launched a severe persecution of Christians or Kirishitans. Let's look at some of the declarations of the Council of Trent. During the same time period, there was a very important council that met and produced a set of extremely heretical documents 
that still govern the church today. That is the Roman Catholic Church. It was the Council of Trent. Pope Pius V was in charge of the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent was a Catholic council held from 1545 to 1563. And it was done in an attempt to destroy the progress of the Protestant Reformation. So in a way, the Council of Trent was a reaction against the Protestants. This council denied every Reformation doctrine, including scripture alone and grace alone. Trent held uh, 125 anathemas or eternal damnation. So if something is anathema, that means that person or that object is eternally damned. And these 125 anathemas were held against Bible-believing Christians, Baptists, mainly Baptists. These proclamations and anathemas were fleshed out in the murderous persecutions vented upon Bible-believing Christians by Rome. And the solemn fact is that the Council, the Council of Trent had never been annulled. Let me just say that again. Whatever was decided in the Council of Trent, everything stands still until today. It has never been annulled or even questioned. The Vatican II Council of the mid-1960s referred to Trent dozens of times, quoted Trent's proclamations as authority and reaffirmed Trent on every hand. The New Catholic Catechism cites Trent no less than 99 times. There is not the slightest hint that the proclamations of the Council of Trent have been abrogated by Rome in any way. At the opening of the Second Vatican Council, Pope John XXIII stated, I do accept entirely all that has been decided and declared at the Council of Trent. Every cardinal, bishop, and priest who participated in the Vatican II Council signed a document affirming Trent. The following are excerpts from this council's decrees. If anyone does not accept as sacred and canonical the aforesaid books in their entirety and with all their parts. And that is the 66 books of the Bible plus the 12 apocryphal books. As they have been accustomed to be read in the Catholic Church and as they are contained in the old Latin Vulgate edition. And knowingly and deliberately rejects the aforesaid traditions, let him be anathema. In other words, let him be eternally damned. If anyone says that the justice received is not preserved and also not increased before God through good works, but that those works are merely the fruits and signs of justification obtained, but not the cause of its increase, let him be anathema. In other words, let him be eternally damned. If anyone says that in the Roman church, which is the mother and mistress of all churches, there is not the true doctrine concerning the sacrament of baptism, let him be anathema. If anyone says that baptism is optional, that is not necessary for salvation, let him be 
and a female. If anyone says that children, because they have not the act of believing, are not after having received baptism to be numbered among the faithful, and that for this reason are to be rebaptized when they have reached the years of discretion, let him be anathema. If anyone denies that in the sacrament of the most holy Eucharist are contained truly, really, and substantially the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and subsequently the whole Christ, but says that he is in it only as a sign or figure or force, let him be anathema. If anyone denies that sacramental confession was instituted by divine law or is necessary to salvation or says that the manner of confessing secretly to a priest alone which the catholic church has always observed from the beginning and still observes is at variance with the institution and command of christ and is a human contrivance let him be anathema. And just to point out, auricular confession was brought in somewhere around 1200. If anyone says that the bishops who are chosen by the authority of the Roman pontiff, in other words, the Pope, are not true and legitimate bishops, but merely human deception, let him be anathema. Father God, we just thank you for this insight that we can have into the history of the church and of all the incredible things that have happened and the 50 to 60 million Baptists that were burnt at the stake in your name. And we just thank you for everything that you've shown us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're now going to listen to a beautiful piece of music, Wash Away. This is a musical interlude, Wash Away. Wash away, wash away from my heart this pain. Let the rain fall down and wash away. Father, 
in the name of Jesus Christ for this beautiful music. Now, talking about the church and about Jesus Christ, and you might ask yourself how to become a follower of Jesus Christ. How to become a Christian? How do you become a Christian? So if you feel compelled to take your first step towards God, you can do that right now, wherever you are. It doesn't matter where you are. The first thing you need to do is acknowledge the problem. And that is, we have all sinned. And that sin separates us from God. So no matter how good you think you are, no matter how many good things you try to do, it is still not good enough to get into heaven. It can't be earned, but it is a gift. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3 verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6 verse 23. And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lashes, viousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Mark chapter 7 verses 20 to 23. And the second thing you need to do is to discover the solution. The solution is Jesus Christ. The only way for God to bridge the gap between himself and us is through his son, Jesus Christ. His death was a substitute for us. He paid the penalty for our sins. Jesus Christ paid the penalty for our sins. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3 verse 16. For Christ author also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. 1 Peter 3 verse 18. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. X 4 verse 12. And the third step is to respond. Believe, repent, confess, Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. To be saved, we must believe that Jesus is Lord and believe that he died for our sins. This confession acknowledges before God that we are able to attain righteousness on our own and that we accept his plan for our lives. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Acts 16 verse 31. Yet to all who receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. John 1 verse 12. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts 2 
verse 38. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Luke 5, verse 32. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, verse 9. Pray this prayer with sincerity of heart. Dear God, I believe in you and that your Son, Jesus Christ, is Lord. I believe in his sacrifice for my sins and his resurrection from the dead. I repent and ask forgiveness for my sins and I'm deciding now to follow you. Please come into my life through the gift of your Holy Spirit. It is in the Lord Jesus' name that I ask and receive. Amen. Amen. Sincerity of heart. What is sincerity of heart? The Bible says doing these things with Sincerity means you are a Christian or a Christ follower, and you will have eternal life in heaven. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. 1 John 5 verse 13. Use caution in trusting your feelings as feelings change. Stand on God's promises. They never change. Recommended growth steps. Pray. Praying is you talking to God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Ephesians 6 verse 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands with wrath and doubting. 1 Timothy 2 verse 8. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Matthew 7 verse 7. Announcements. Join us every Sunday at 10 a.m. and Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Just go to abundance.online.church, abundance.online.church at 10 o'clock Sunday morning or 7 p.m. Wednesday night. You can also go to our website, altmedasa.co.za forward slash church. It's A L T. M-E-D-A-S-A dot C-O dot Z-A forward slash church. Father God, we thank you for this beautiful time that we could spend together, these insights into the history of the, of the church, how things developed over the years, and how the church became what it is today, the different churches. And thank you that your spirit of God has inspired us to really understand these things and to, to find a blessing in them. And we just pray that you'll speak to us over the week that comes and really bless us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to play out with What Child Is This? It's a beautiful piece of music. I just want to say a final blessing in the name of of our Lord in the name of the Father. May you be blessed as you go through the week that comes in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. What child is this?
Joy.